What's up guys, Jay's Two Cents here, and uh, I'm gonna do a talking head video today, so feel free to minimize it, put on your favorite music or whatever, and uh, just, have, just listen, because with all the rumors swirling around about AMD's new platform coming out, new socket, with that potentially new DDR5 memory, I wanted to kind of talk to those that are on the fence about Ryzen, because trust me, I was in that same exact boat as you guys, where I was just like, you know what, there's no way AMD could ever fight back and top a Intel when it comes to being top dog. That was then, this is now. So we're gonna tell you about what our experience has been like considering both Phil, Nick, and I have AMD rigs here at the studio. And uh, Phil and I have been using AMD exclusively now for the last several years. Today's video is sponsored by iFixit and iFixit's Father's Day Today's video is sponsored by iFixit and their iFixit Father's Day promotion. And they figured the best way to show my love for Father's Day is to torture her with some Father's Day jokes. Are you ready? How does Darth Vader take his toast? No. <laughs> On the dark side. Did you know the circle is the most ridiculous shape in the world? There's absolutely no point to it. I was gonna tell you a dad joke about construction, but I'm still working on it. What do you get if you put ducks in a cement mixer? You get quacks in the pavement. <laughs> so this Father's Day, give your father figure the best gift ever by heading to the link in the description below where you can save $10 off any order $50 or more by using my link and offer code DADS2021. What do you, what do you think? You like my, you like my jokes? <laughs> All right, so without wasting a lot of you guys' time going into like a history lesson on Ryzen, we've, we've talked about it in the past. We've covered obviously first gen Ryzen, which was like 1800X and 1700X and all that. We talked about the 1.5 Ryzen, which was the 2000 series and 3000 series. We're obviously now fast forwarded uh, five years into Ryzen 2 or Zen 2 architecture, which is Ryzen 5000 series. And with the newest generation coming out, I believe rumored later this year, I have no information on that. I'm not embargoed or anything, I don't know. So I'm just telling you what I think the, uh, all the signs are pointing to. I think it's important to talk about where we've come from in terms of kind of weirdness that we used to experience. Cause I could never talk about Ryzen without being like, Ryzen's great, but it's kind of weird. We have weird issues. And, and I wanna talk about that because that is what I think puts off a lot of people. So when we first started using Ryzen, I did a video, and this is actually before Phil even started working here. I did a video where I always had my Intel X299 platforms. That's X99 and then X299 and Intel, because at the time, Intel had the highest core counts. In fact, Intel had the only real competition in town because Zen wasn't out yet, and they hadn't touched their platform since uh, or, uh, Bulldozer and Excavator and all that, which is the FX series. So it was like, I think Power Driver was the last one. but. It, uh, it just was terrible. It, it was a 2011 architecture. It was bad. It was non efficient. It were like shared cache between cores and it was just terrible, absolutely terrible. And so Intel was the only game in town. If you want to high core counts and you had to go like X299 and all of that. I did a 30 day, here's how Ryzen went using it for only 30 days. And that was back when the 1800X was the CPU that was, that was the top of the line at the time, not counting, counting Threadripper. I, had issues with Threadripper and that, we talked about that in the past already. So I've been using AMD exclusively now here in the studio for about the last three years. And Phil has been using Threadripper exclusively for the last, what, about two years maybe, year and a half, two years at least. Now Phil has a perspective obviously from the production side of things, editing videos, how Ryzen and Premiere specifically kind of interact, um, obviously gaming as well. I, on the other hand, use my system because it's not the one we rely on to make videos, to test out different hardware. So I've, I've been on Threadripper, I've been on standard Ryzen, I've been on the different cores within Ryzen, water-cooled, air-cooled, all of it. And so I can tell you right now, the weird issues that we always experienced with Ryzen were USB drop-offs. That'd be the simple one. And the nice thing is that the chipset manufacturers and the chipset BIOS writers and such and driver writers for AMD motherboards, like whether it be Gigabyte, you know, Asus, MSI, ASRock, in the beginning, rollouts were kind of slow, seeing any sort of fixes. And it seemed like, well, it's not seemed like, it was the fact that companies initially weren't putting a lot of R&D into AMD products, although it was a new platform, because it wasn't proven yet. And by proven, it mean it wasn't proven that people were gonna adopt it and build on it right away. As in, uh, AMD started getting back market share, and having more Ryzen processors in the field, they started putting way more effort into BIOS updates, which I feel like BIOS updates for AMD boards are rolling out constantly. 
Some might look at that and be like, well, it's because they're constantly having problems. No, they're constantly tweaking things. They're constantly getting better memory support. They're constantly getting better driver support in the chipsets and USB drivers and, and M.2 controllers and all that sort of stuff. So it's like everything has just been improving. So the USB dropout issue was something we were experiencing in the beginning, even on uh, as late as like 3000 series processors, where we'd be out here filming and then we would hear someone's system inside the editing den disconnect a USB device. We would just randomly hear doo 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 and be like, whose PC was that? I don't know. And we would go in there and investigate whose mouse isn't working, whose keyboard isn't working, or whose, you know, whatever. And we never found anything wasn't working. So it's almost like it would drop off and never make a reconnect sound, probably because it happens so quickly. Um, it was just sort of annoying, to say the least. The other issue that I experienced uh, more regular was stability issues with RAM. RAM in the beginning was a sore spot for Ryzen because the way the CPU works with its Infinity Fabric and the way the chiplets connect on the substrate through the Infinity Fabric and the memory controller also being uh, as, or on the chip, memory was always finely tuned for Intel. And Intel really addressed it in a very traditional way, whereas AMD really brought a new architecture and a completely redesigned way of having uh, memory communicate with the CPU and how the CPU communicates with itself and the chipset even was very different. And so what you would find is that you would have to run the DDR4 memory at like its base speeds or maybe a little bit above, because if you tried to go anywhere near the advertised XMP profile or the extreme memory profile that always worked on Intel with AMD, it wouldn't work. Or if it did work, you would get some weird issues like you'd, you'd load the memory speed, which also loads sub timings, which usually tightens those up too. And then you would boot the system and it would work perfectly fine. You shut it down, you go to turn it on and then it starts boot looping, just doing it over and over and over again. And the only way you could get your system to reboot again would be to clear CMOS or unless the motherboard was advanced enough to realize it had three failed boots and then it would automatically clear its own CMOS or revert to safe, safe settings. Then you would find that, you know, it would work fine again until you enabled fast RAM and then it would start doing the same thing. It would work perfectly fine. Or in the system, you'd start getting weird hangs where you wouldn't even blue screen. You would just have a system completely hang. And it always boiled down to the memory. Well, that's an issue that's sort of disappeared now because once again, like I said, not only have we seen the BIOS become improved, we've also seen the RAM manufacturers improve their support for Ryzen CPUs where they can identify the platform that they're in and automatically, based on depending on the platform they're in, be able to run the fastest timings and the fastest memory speeds that they believe is gonna be reliable. Now you could always go in there and fine tune it, obviously. And what you'll typically find with AMD though, is that the fastest RAM speeds for AMD is slower than the fastest RAM speeds available for Intel. But again, that's because again, this is newer architecture that's accessing RAM in a completely different way than Intel is. So you're gonna find that discrepancy in speed. Fortunately, now that we're up to 3,800 megahertz and 4,000 megahertz RAM sticks running fine on both Ryzen and Threadripper, it, anything beyond that we've shown in previous videos that is, it's kind of a diminished return. You pay way more for something you're not gonna get any tangible performance increase out of. So it's one of those things where that was an argument to maybe not consider Ryzen that sort of disappeared. The other issues that we would experience uh, almost always came down to us screwing around with overclocks. Uh, we like to overclock here. Phil likes to overclock, I like to overclock. We're firm believers in overclocking because it's extra performance for free if you have the cooling and the power and the robustness, this ability of a motherboard to be able to push high core count CPUs with the voltage they need uh, and the power draw to be able to keep, do it safely without blowing something up, specifically a VRM or a capacitor or something like that. But we found that with the way AMD works, often would slow down your performance because you were limit, although you were getting a higher all core, you were dramatically slowing down your single and dual core performance. So it got to the point where even overclocking Ryzen kind of became pointless in this, so you're just a tinkerer and got bored. Or you had a motherboard that is, I think there's only one on the market right now that would actually allow you to set a separate single core and all core speed. A lot of motherboards will allow you to do that now, but I think it was the uh, Crosshair Dark Hero that was allowing you to really go in and fine tune it. I'd like to see more motherboards provide that because then if we could say, run single core up to five gigs, which we knew they could do, but then do all core up to like four, 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 five, then you could, you, you, you dramatically increase the performance that way. But uh, these are things that we're, we're gonna seeing slowly come out as now AMD's market share has climbed back to, <laughs> Intel can't ignore them any longer. They've tried for the longest time thinking that we as consumers would just not have faith in AMD because they've been so terrible in the past with their FX series CPUs. They dramatically underestimated 
their enemy, and yes, their enemies, but it's kind of like that old, that old adage in war, right? Never react based on what you think your opponent's gonna do, react on what you think and know they can do. That's how you need to look at battle, if you will. And they clearly didn't look and see what they can do. They didn't, they underestimated the talent that Lisa Sue had put together with AMD. And this is probably freaking a lot of you guys out going, I never imagined Jay would do an ad for AMD. I'm not doing an ad. We're telling you our long-term user reports. I'm telling you as someone that also had a hard time believing in the beginning that Zen, although great, would have the legs to overthrow Intel for IPC, which we've seen now for the last two generations, they are superior with IPC, core count per cost, and then just overall uh, user adoption rate. You, if, you look, if you look at the CPU market share right now and how much AMD has encroached on, yes, Intel still has the overwhelming market share. But if you start to look at like laptops and servers and desktops and all that stuff, and you take all that into account, yeah, Intel has an overwhelming majority. But if you start just looking at like the Steam survey and you start looking at average consumers that are building gaming rigs, that is a much different story there. And with that story, motherboard manufacturers start to invest more money into the quality of the motherboards because they know people are buying the platform. If you're a motherboard manufacturer, why would you want to spend a ton of money developing an amazing board that's never going to sell because people aren't buying it? Or, by it being AMD CPUs. So that's clearly changed. And with that came a major stability increase with systems all along. Now, everything hasn't been perfect. First of all, we'll start with my experience with gaming. Now, I was running an air-cooled Threadripper 3950X, which is the 28-core variant, with an air-cooler and an air-cooled graphics card and all that because I we actually did a build on that. If you guys want to remember that system, you can go look it up and I used an air-cooler, which is something that's surprising to many people. I was just curious, can I run a high core count 28 core 56 thread CPU with air cooling and, and not have any issues? And spoiler alert, yeah, it's fine. But I ran a 1200 watt Thor power supply from ASUS, a 2080 Ti, um, I don't remember what brand it was, but it was, it was a custom, uh, I think it was a Strix actually, it was a 28 Ti Strix card. And then um, obviously the 28 core CPU had no problems whatsoever until I dropped in 3080. When 30 series came out, I started getting random shutdowns. When I say random shutdowns, I mean completely random. Always when trying to game. Now to understand what that, when I say only trying to game means, your graphics card has basically two modes in it. A 2D mode, which is when you're at the desktop and it's a 2D mode just with a higher core clock if you're doing things on the desktop like transitions and whatnot. But when you go into a game, it will then switch into a 3D mode where all of the gizmos and doodads in your graphics card designed to make your high FPS numbers and all the magic come out, uh, those features will turn on. It didn't matter what game I was playing. I would always, at some point, whether it be right at the start of loading the game or in the middle of playing a game, get a complete hard OCP shutdown. Now, OCP stands for overcurrent protection. And that's where the power supply, there's a breaker inside the power supply, it's digitally controlled, but it's a breaker inside the power supply that will, just like on a, the panel on the side of your house, will trip and pushing the power button will do nothing, it won't come back online. It does that because it saves itself thinking Something's going to fry because something said, I need more power than I can give you. Now, 1200 watt Thor power supply should be plenty. It is plenty. It's more than, more than enough power for the system that I had running it. But what I found was that going back to the 2080 Ti alleviated my problem. In fact, it was so inconsistent. We tried to even make a video about it, but we had to scrap it because we couldn't, cr we couldn't make the problem. It's like when you take your car to the mechanic and you go, this is happening and he keeps his car for two days and he goes, it never happens for us. You pick up the car and it doesn't on the way home. It's exactly like that. We could not recreate the problem. However, if you look at Twitter and you look at Reddit and you, t and you just ask people, in fact, I even did a tweet not that long ago saying, anyone in SoCal have a problem with their computer that continuously has any sort of an issue? We'd like to maybe start taking people's computers and building or doing videos about fixing them, showing people how to troubleshoot. Over and over and over again, I saw people saying they have Ryzen systems that will do random shutdowns when gaming. But I'll see specific games on there, like the new Modern Warfare. And then I would see other people talk about another specific game. I can't remember what it is, but it was always like the same games. But the weird part is going between a 2080 Ti to a 3080, is 20, what, uh, no, 70 watts of power difference, 250 watt versus 320. That's not enough to cause a problem. 
But I can tell you having experience in the past with other power supplies and weirdness and the way the rails are set up and 28 core CPU, if you have you know, multiple rail power supply and depending on the plugs you have to plugged into in the back of the power supply, you, you need to kind of split up the power going between the rails. Now the power supply should do it automatically. However, I never could get it to stop shutting down on me regardless of what I did with the power. It wasn't until we finally just switched to the 5000 series, which I'm currently running a 5900X, this exact, this is the box right here. I haven't had a problem since, whether it's on 30 series or 20 series. In fact, it's running a 3090 right now with absolutely no problem whatsoever. But that's an issue that I have to admit, I could not get to the bottom of. Now, sure, I didn't completely unwire it and switch out the power supply. But if you address that from the perspective of I'm an average user at home without a studio full of parts to just start swapping stuff out. You know, if you're having a problem with your engine, you can't just swap it in another engine to see if the first engine was the problem, right? You don't typically approach troubleshooting that way. But short of putting in a different power supply, which I told Phil over and over, I'm almost positive, it's something weird between the Thor power supply and the 30 series graphics card we were running. By the way, we did it with Founders Edition graphics card, same problem. We did it with the EVGA graphics card, same problem, and did it with the Tuff series graphics card, same problem. So three different graphics cards exhibiting the same behavior. I, I still believe it was a problem with that power supply being very sensitive OCP uh, overcurrent protection built in. I've experienced it in the past. In fact, the same thing happened with Nick. If you watch the video where we upgraded his system, we upgraded him to Ryzen, put in all his stuff, and then he started having random shutdowns. When we were updating Windows, installing Windows, trying to install games, he was getting random shutdowns until I swapped his power supply and then everything was fine. In fact, I don't know if you guys remember that, but that was only a couple months ago that that issue happened. Now, regarding the productivity side of it, Phil has been running uh, Ryzen now for a long time, specifically on Threadripper. When he first started with me back in 2018, wow, wow, 2018, holy crap. Been a while, right? Yeah, over three years now. We started him with a 1950X Threadripper. He had all kinds of weirdness with that one. In fact, I felt like every time I came into the studio, if he were there before me, his system's half torn apart and he's going, ah, it's just locking up again or it's being dumb or it restarts. And the first generation Threadripper was rough. It was rough. It, I feel like, it, it, it was like when a puppy, a puppy dog in a big body, you know, some dogs like Great Danes and their puppies are just floppy and knocking everything over and their paws are too big for their bodies and they're just crashing into everything. I feel like that was Threadripper, if you wanna know the truth. It was a big Great Dane puppy. Fast forward now, he's only used Threadripper with the exception of a small stint of using 9900K because he wanted to use uh, QuickSync and there was, greatness there, but then once we move back over to just hardware brute forcing it with Threadripper, specifically with his 3970X, which is a 32 core, 64 thread with 64 gigs of RAM system, he just powers through timelines and such. Now, everything was perfect with that system. From the moment we built it, in fact, we have a build log on that. That's the orange soft tube one. You guys got all mad because it wasn't hard tubing, even though you couldn't understand we had to be able to easily service the system because it makes all these videos. Everything was fine until one, I wanted to overclock it. And once I wanted to overclock it, all the weirdness happens. And I had Phil told me one day, hey, I got the system to be nice and stable. I was like, yeah, what'd you do? He goes, undid your overclock. So overclocking on, on Ryzen for the reason I already mentioned is weird because of, again, the single core and then gigantic amount of cores overclocking is weird. If you just let it handle it itself, everything's fine. Don't try and mess with the RAM. Just let it run at DOCP. Just don't screw with it. Everything's fine. Timeline scrubbing was insane. He's dealing with like four, native 4K footage and he's just like, look at this, this is absolutely crazy. It's just, he was just like, ah, oh. he was like super excited about it. Until we swapped out the 2080 Ti to an RTX 3080. Remember recently I did a video saying, giving Phil the upgrade he deserves because he plays games on that system, obviously, as well as produces all these videos. He uses uh, pretty much primarily the Adobe Suite. Remember we're talking about Premiere, and we're talking about After Effects. A lot of the functionality that he uses in Premiere is single-threaded. So it didn't matter if you have 64 of them, if it's only using one to do things like work stabilization and whatnot, and I believe that's multi-threaded now at some point, but depending on what effects he's adding in After Effects, there's a lot of single-threaded performance that happens there. So keeping that single-thread core speed up and not screwing it up with the overclocks, like I said, is very important. But the timeline, that uses the Mercury engine as well as CUDA to accelerate it. So when you're scrubbing and all that, it's using the GPU to handle all of that playback. And when you start adding layers of effects and you start adding transitions and you start adding text and all that, that's all handled by the GPU. And he started noticing 
random, just non-responsiveness. In fact, I've looked over plenty of times and I, I just hear him sigh and I look over and it's just a white screen and it's like, it stopped responding and then he's like, oh God, here we go again. Or sometimes he'll go to scrub the timeline and it, the timeline scrub will move, the playback won't, and he'll hit play and he'll hear audio, but nothing's playing back. And these are all issues that started when we went with the 30 series graphics card. So now I've, I've told you about one system that shuts off with 30 series, and then another system that won't play back properly with 30 series. And it doesn't matter if you, he's tried studio drivers, he's tried the standard drivers. But with the 2080 Ti, yeah, he, did, he ran the studio drivers, but he had an uptime of something like three months. In fact, let's mention that now, we never turn our systems off here. I think Nick might turn his off, but I don't turn mine off. I let it go to sleep for days or weeks at a time, which is something I never do at home, because one of the things I'm looking for is will it come back, to, back awake? The early generation Zen stuff used to go to sleep and not wake up, just not respond. Or we've had issues in the past where uh, Phil's system, like I mentioned with the 30 series, he wanted to clean his keyboard and he'd turn the system off, it would turn off, and then it would just turn right back on for no reason whatsoever. You tell it shut down, it shuts down, and then it goes, I don't wanna be shut down, and it turns back on. So these are the types, types of weirdness that we had experienced, but it's almost like you could correlate a lot of that with the 30 series upgrade, which is really weird to us, and we don't know why yet, but it's been solid lately. He hasn't had any issues, and so we just kind of left it alone. But these are the sort of weirdness that we still experience. But I feel like our use case is a lot different than many people's where not many people have a full production Threadripper system running and then a, another one like mine that's kind of a Frankenstein that's always changing parts out. That way we can test other things. Although that can't happen now that it's all rigid tubes. So I have to build another AMD system to Frankenstein around. But I, I mean, everything is, is as time goes on. I hate that, that cliche of like, it's aging like fine wine. But it really is. So there's, there's still weird nuances to this platform, but they're, they're so rare now that we've been able to use them for years. We don't even have, we have one running sy Intel system here in the studio. It's a 10900K system that's part of, it's our test batch. We don't even run Intel in here, period. Even our stream machine that we run our podcast off of is Ryzen. We are straight up Ryzen fanboys at this point, if you want to call us that, because the performance is there, the price is there, the support is there, but more importantly for us, the belief in the company is there. And this is why I am really excited for what AMD is gonna be able to do with their next generation graphics cards. Now we're gonna be obviously waiting a while for that. But if you look at the amount of, just how far they came with Radeon 7 and then Vega 64 prior to that, to the 6000 series graphics cards and how much gap they made up with NVIDIA. Sure, they're still on par with NVIDIA's first generation RT cores, and they're just now getting FSR, which is their version of uh, like a DLSS to the table, which is admittedly gonna probably only be as good as first generation DLSS, but looking at the potential and looking at the trends tell us next generation graphics cards, hopefully everyone's back online with their full manufacturing production and can keep up with demand, show us that we're gonna have a real shootout. I hope to see what we're seeing with what Ryzen is doing to Intel happen to Nvidia. Because Lord knows they need to get their ass kicked a little bit for Nvidia to start probably making some changes when it comes to the way they treat their customers, the way they treat their, their, the overall market, because they really do believe they're untouchable. And I, I think if you ignore AMD long enough, the same thing's gonna happen to you that happened to Intel. But if you're on the fence, and you're like, I want, I want, I want to build a new platform. Fortunately, the CPUs and motherboards and stuff are not nearly as impacted by the shortages as like graphics cards are because graphics cards are also a money-making tool for many people like Bitcoin and, or not Bitcoin, but Ethereum and, and all the other coins. Um, CPUs are something you can still tend to, to get fairly easily without crazy markups. You owe it to yourself to at least do some due diligence and research on what people are saying about Ryzen. Go to the the Reddit slash AMD or the AMD subreddit, because you might think that that's all fanboys. There's a lot of people in there. They're very honest about their, their experience and are very quick to call out AMD on, on problems that, that, are, that are consistent and need to be addressed. You're not gonna find just a group of fanboys. You're gonna find a lot of people that are very open about both being positive and negative when it comes to the brand. Because let's face it, no product and no brand is perfect, period, ever, end of story, never gonna happen. So I can tell you right now though, I have never been more confident in recommending AMD than I am today. Anyway guys, sound off with your comments down below and specifically your particular experience if you've been running Ryzen. Which generation is it? What CPU is it? 
And what are the pros and the cons so far for you? I think you'll find some pretty wide ranging experience, but uh, I think at the end of the day, you're gonna find most people are pretty damn happy with their purchase. Anyway guys, thanks for watching. Don't forget about our GPU giveaway. We have a massive giveaway happening right now. We've been plugging it a lot. If you guys haven't heard of it, you might kick yourself for not even taking the minute chance of winning, because let's face it, lots of people enter these giveaways at getting a brand new, yeah, it's an Intel platform, but hey, it's free. You can't complain about that. But more importantly, an RTX 3090 and all the gizmos to go with it to build a brand new system, short of a case and uh, essentially storage at that point. So anyway guys, thanks for watching. It is worldwide. Links are down below. As always, we'll see you in the next one.